Welcome back to the Stand for Initiative. Um, we're going to kick off a new session that is going to focus on firms, investors, and global capital allocations. And this is with my co-authors, Brian Nyman and Jesse Schreger, also the co-organizers of the initiative. I'll take the first module of the session to give you an overview of why do we care about capital allocation. And in some sense, it will be more general uh, than the specific research papers that we will cover in the rest of the session. And it should be really treated as an introduction to the field uh, more generally or to a topic more generally. Uh, the basic question is, that we care about is who gets capital from whom around the world? Uh, why do we care? We care because this affects um, risks that, for example, are shared. Um, is the US exposed to China or is Europe, um, you know, France exposed to Germany? Uh, but it's not just about a descriptive version of the risk that we share. There's also an element of uh, these positions or these capital allocations endogenously generating new risks, uh, for example, through externalities, through financial amplifications. Um, it, it's a wide topic uh, that economists have cared about for a long time. And typically, we think of the benefits as being transferring capital from savers to productive users that might have productive ideas, uh, but not enough capital uh, to pursue them. We also think of the benefits as sharing risk more globally, uh, so diversifying portfolios. Uh, it's one way to reduce uh, the prevalence of idiosyncratic risks uh, globally. We also think of these flows of capital, so the changes in allocation of capital over time, as forces that might equilibrate exchange rates. This goes back to the Friedman you know, stabilizing speculation. It might, for example, equalize or stabilize safe interest rates at government rates um, around the country, or you know, even the private cost of borrowing. It might be that firms in a particular uh, country are facing high cost of capital because there isn't enough capital domestically, and if capital comes in from abroad, uh, that lowers the cost of capital. Of course, over the years, we've um, come to understand that there are a number of problems uh, that also come with the global allocation of capital. For example, capital flights. Uh, we just went through a major episode during the early part of the COVID crisis where capital flew out very fast from emerging markets. Um, we also came to understand that there is endogenous amplification of these risks. Um, for example, if we lend a lot to an emerging market in their foreign currency and the exchange rate depreciates, this has a negative wealth effect on that country. The negative wealth effect itself might induce more uh, depreciation as the foreign investors try to pull out even further. Um, more recently, we started thinking about unequal access to capital. Um, if you take a look at who dominates capital markets globally, uh, you will quickly realize that large governments and large firms play a very big role. And in particular for the firms, uh, this might not be a level playing field. Uh, that if you're a small firm, you're not, you might not have uh, as easy a time as accessing the global capital market as uh, your larger counterparties. Similarly, if you focus on the very, very large firms, there are all sorts of reasons why they might use these international uh, margins uh, to actually game the system a little bit. For example, evade regulation or try to reduce their tax burden or try to uh, seek out particularly investors in a way that uh, might not be optimally socially. Uh, these are all issues that uh, fundamentally rely on the knowledge of who owns what around the world and how do these heterogeneous players behave. And that's really where the data work has come in, is trying to provide uh, detailed answers uh, to these questions. Uh, but if I step away before we even talk about data and think about a very simple example, like a micro 101, you want to think about two countries or two firms. There is I and J. They have a very you know, standard portfolio production function with some productivity and some capital. I'm going to start from labor for a second, just for the sake of simplicity. And you can think of firm or country J having a much lower capital stock than country I. And the basic question has always been, should capital flow from country I to country J? And does it in practice? Or you could do it within two firms within the same country. And under very you know, mild conditions on the production function, the classic neoclassical explanation or the prediction is, Yes, it should flow until the marginal product of capital is equalized. Now, this very simple French list benchmark uh, you know, was put forward uh, most prominently in international by Lucas, who said, look, we should be expecting capital to flow from very rich countries with high capital stocks uh, to, for example, emerging markets that might have a lower capital stock and a high marginal product of capital. 
And the fact that it doesn't in practice has stimulated all sorts of research um, over time. Uh, so this very simple benchmark has been such an interesting place uh, to start asking questions. People have started thinking about risk. Well, what if these two firms have different risks? You wouldn't think you want to always put all your money into the firm with the highest return. You want to sort of risk adjust. What if there is wasteful default or expropriation? Maybe the returns to the investment depend on the identity of the investor. Maybe foreign investors get a much different rate of return than domestic investors because we selectively expropriate uh, the foreigners. But then you can think of like more deeper down the frictions. A lot of the capital is allocated by institutional investors, mutual funds, banks, insurance companies, or by firms themselves through the you know, direct investment or governments through official flows. And these various players might have different objectives uh, from the simple abstract uh, aggregate neoclassical model. Um, similarly for the firms, um, you know, it's one thing to say we have one cost of capital, we all borrow at the same rate, and the supply of capital is infinitely elastic at that rate, uh, versus the reality, as soon as you start looking at the micro data, you, try to you figure out that there are variable costs in raising capital, but there's also fixed costs. I need to have accounting systems. I need to reach out to the investors and make them aware of who I am as a firm. I need lawyers, I need bankers. All of these things uh, can have a very large fixed cost that might prevent a smaller firm uh, from actually accessing uh, the capital. And I'm gonna start by taking the perspective of the investors. In particular, you can think of a very simple benchmark and at some level, it's a crazy benchmark, but benchmarks are useful precisely in their craziness because they sharpen what it is that we need to think about to generate realistic deviations. If you think of the World Cap M, everybody should be holding some form of a risk asset and the same exact world portfolio of all risky investments. We might only defer in the extent to which we own the proportion in which we own the safe asset and the risky portfolio, but we're gonna own these two things. Now, of course, immediately you might think that that's not the right idea. Many assets are not traded. My future labor income cannot be traded. And for example, if my future labor income is particularly you know, correlated with some risks, I might wanna tilt my portfolio towards assets that are negatively related to those risks. As we'll see, the data is extremely far from this very simple benchmark. Uh, two very well-known phenomena are home country bias, the idea that countries disproportionately invest in securities or assets that are domestic, and currency bias, the idea that investors disproportionately hold uh, securities that are denominated in their own currency, in the currency that is domestic. Why are the deviations there? So as soon as you have a benchmark, you start thinking about how could I deviate? And fundamentally, uh, I'm not gonna go deep into theory, uh, but you can think of uh, the forces that drive portfolio decisions globally as being the covariance between an object and I'm gonna call M, a stochastic discount factor. You wanna think of it as a proxy for the risks that I care about and the return on the assets, okay? And the other two terms that are in that equation are tau, which I'm gonna to take to be frictions. Uh, I perceive a different rate of return from the true rate of return R uh, because there are some frictions that dissipate uh, some of the returns. You can think of tau as a number between, for example, zero and one, one being no frictions at all. But also there might be an information set. Um, so let me start from the information frictions. One very simple story is, well, I might have much better information on the firms that are closest to me. They're the things that I am familiar with, I know their managers, I know their history, or maybe I know their products, because so that's why I shop every day at the supermarket. And that might lead me to overweight these firms because I have a much better information. The second one is the tau, is the transaction cost. And you know, I really mean transaction cost in a very a broad sense, not just the fees that you pay to take on the investment, uh, but also, for example, expropriation risk. Uh, maybe as a foreigner, I, I don't perceive the true rate of return R that the domestic investors perceive. I perceive that one minus some per percentage that gets expropriated from me. It might be sovereign default. Uh, it might be that it's very difficult in the private market to recover the assets if the firm tries to walk away with some cash. Uh, it might be you know, other, other uh, sort of costs like capital controls. But also it could be that there are no frictions whatsoever, but our simple benchmark is just too crazy. Uh, the actual real proxies for M, the sources of risk, are very different uh, from the world cap M. Uh, 
uh, maybe the domestic assets in domestic currency are a very good hedge uh, for the risks that I care about. If I now switch from the investors into the firms, if I start thinking about the duality between the investor problem and the firm problem, uh, the stock of assets is not constant. Uh, a single investor might take the world stock of assets as being constant, uh, but a firm, for example, or a government can choose what to issue. Um, and for example, if investors have biases and markets are segmented, the firms of the government might decide to cater to these biases to reduce their own cost of capital. Think of a world where US investors only want to buy assets in dollars. Well, maybe European firms want to issue in dollars to tap in the supply of capital in the US. They're gonna be the arbitrageurs going around and trying to tap all sorts of margins around the world. But of course, this might lead to unequal access because only large firms in Europe might have the economic ability, the scale necessary to issue, for example, bonds or receive loans in multiple currencies. You might think I need to hedge them. I need to be smart enough to, to deal with like foreign currency payments. Uh, there might be other requirements like having a treasury that can deal with all this. All of these are in some sense fixed costs. Um, there might be also some costs. Um, and this might lead, for example, to the global market being dominated by large firms, something that Jesse Schrager will, will show you much more about later. Um, if that's the world you live in, now there are interesting questions. When you open up the capital account of a country, when you liberalize and you say, well, I'm gonna make it very easy to get capital from foreigners, uh, this might have distributional consequences. Small and large firms might not benefit equally. Um, and these are things that we just started studying um, as a field, at least at the micro level. The second thing that I think uh, we come to more prominently realize in recent years is the importance of governments. And this is a very active research agenda. Uh, governments are big in global capital flows, not only in the private market, where, for example, they are sovereign debt borrowers, but more recently, they are also very large investors. There are enormous sovereign wealth funds, like the Norwegian Pension Fund, that are very meaningful holders of assets around the world. And they might have a very different uh, value function, a very different incentives to invest than private uh, small in, smaller investors. But also there is the official market. This is sort of government to government. Uh, there's always been development aid, uh, but there are also very large strategic investments. Think of like the Marshall Plan from the US, but also the China Belt and Road Initiative right now. Um, you know, these are, might have very different motives from the traditional risk taking that we put in our models. Uh, but in the data, they're very meaningful parts of global capital flows. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting work going on right now trying to understand them. Uh, another aspect of the government is the provision of safe assets. So I want you to think of the international monetary system as fundamentally an agreement about producing safe assets. There's in short supply, there's lots of risky stuff around the world, but there is not enough safe things. And the governments have a key role in producing it. Now, for living memory, at least for, you know, given that this audience is all young people like us, um, the US has been the hegemon in this system. It's been the main provider, a dollar has been centered. But I want you to sort of think that this isn't static. This is a research question. Uh, the world did not always look like this. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this picture, but if you take a very brief look at the last, say, 200 years of monetary history, uh, you find very often big changes where the UK in the 1870s was the corner store of world financial markets. Between the two war, you find the US and the UK both playing a very meaningful role. And then ultimately you see the US taking over after 19, uh, 1940s and you know, having this very long run um, as the global provider of safe assets. But recently we're thinking about China, we're thinking about other issues. So you don't want to take these things as, uh, as static. Now, why do we care about the role of the dollar? Um, well, we care because the dollar is used to allocate capital um, between lenders and borrowers that might never involve the US. That's the international role of the currency. What does that really mean? Why do we care? Well, one is it might give an outsized role to US monetary policy. US changes rates and all of a sudden the lending rate between Europe and Brazil uh, is changing as a response because it's dollar denominated. It might have very large distributional effects. Think of an emerging market firm that has borrowed in dollars. Uh, if he hasn't hedged and the dollar depreciates, that can have a very large negative wealth effect on this emerging market. 
that's what economists refer to originally um, as original sin, uh, particularly in the context of sovereigns. There might be complementarities between the decisions to borrow in dollars and the decisions to price in dollars in the good markets. Uh, whether your export or imports are denominated in dollars, which itself might have interesting consequences when the dollar moves if these prices are sticky. Um, from the perspective of the US, this might give it advantages or disadvantages. One that Jesse will highlight in his session is the ability of US firms to get a lot of foreign capital, even when they're small, because they're borrowing in dollars and everybody sort of is willing to lend uh, in dollars. The last two slides, I'm going to focus on policy. If you want to understand why there's been so much policy about capital flows, you need to think about what happens during crisis. And we've really gone through four generations of models. The first generation was sort of Krugman, um, and it was a very simple, beautiful model where the foreign capital attacks currency peg when the country doesn't have sufficient reserves to defend the peg. The second model, um, was a refinement and it was really motivated empirically by the European exchange rate mechanism crisis of the 90s. Uh, it's a model by Maury Oswald who showed us that these attacks might also come out of the blue. Why? Because the foreign capital so vastly exceeds uh, the domestic resources to defend a speculative attack that it all, all really depends on the coordination of the foreigners, whether they attack or not. Or, so they might come completely unannounced. The third model, it's very used these days. It's the models uh, of endogenous mismatches that were uh, really created based on the Asian financial crisis where Asian economies had borrowed very heavily in foreign currency. And it's the idea that I put forward at the very beginning where uh, my currency depreciates because the foreigners are pulling out of my country. But because I borrow in foreign currency, that induces a negative wealth effect on me. I lose net worth, the banking system lends le less, the economy goes even worse. The foreigners try to pull out even farther and depreciate the currency. And there is a spiral uh, that brings me deeper and deeper into the crisis. In the more recent years, uh, there is what I'm gonna call the fourth model, which is just a generalization of all this. It just simply thinks of the foreigners as being more flighty. Foreign capital pulls out at the first sign of trouble and domestic investors are not a perfect substitute. They cannot come in very quickly and take care of this. Uh, and therefore this creates some externalities. And from a theory perspective, there has been a tremendous amount of work in the last few years, uh, giving us rationales for policies like capital controls, foreign exchange intervention, financial regulation, macroprudential regulation, that are based on addressing these externalities. The fact that investors do not capture all these margins. They might have pecuniary externalities where I don't internalize the actions, my, the effect of my actions on market prices, they might have to do with demand. I don't internalize the effect of my spending on aggregate demand or network. I don't internalize the transactions I make because everybody else is making similar transactions have an effect on financial stability. The really common element of all this is you need to know who owns what. And while the theory literature I think has done important advances, very little has been done empirically. The, the evaluation of these policies is still in its infancy. And this matters. I mean, emerging markets have been long ahead of theory uh, in the practice of these policies. The IMF has only really recently changed its stance on capital controls and effects intervention, agreeing that there are things that under certain conditions we might wanna do. But as economists, um, we don't have clean answers yet. We don't know exactly how they work, how well they work, what are the costs? That's an open question. And I think we're starting to have the data to answer these very important questions. Similarly, and then I'm gonna stop, um, the central banks are collecting incredible data sets on microdata. But it is not an obvious uh, question on how to use it. Should they use all this richness to drive policy? Right now, that's not happening. Uh, why? Because we don't have a framework that tells us exactly which summary statistics we should extract from all this data uh, to figure out what's relevant for policy. But this is a big opportunity for people like you that are entering the research uh, field um, because it, it's likely to have you know, academic impact and real world impact through policy. And these are questions that we care a lot about.